Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a nice uh, day. It's quite nice and sunny out there, even though it looks like it's it's just gone a bit cloudy now. Um, thanks for joining us for the webinar. Um, I'm Maxine. Most of you already know me. If not, I'm sure you've spoken to me before. If you haven't, I am the Business Development Manager at Receptional and I specialise in the sports and gaming sector. I have been with Receptional for about five years. However, currently I feel a little bit like a nursery practitioner, um, which I'm sure relates to a lot of you having sort of a two and a four year old at home. Um, I do apologise, we're not at Google HQ. Their cheese and wine is, is very good. Um, we'll make it up to you once this craziness is all over. The good thing is that we have been able to open up the uh, seminar as a webinar to a wider audience. So, so welcome everyone. As we had planned for this to be a seminar, to kind of make sure it's not too long, we split it into two webinars. So the next part will be on Tuesday, the 22nd of April at two o'clock, where we're going to be discussing how to drive acquisitions with creative content and YouTube ads. We are going to be sharing the slides afterwards and we will be recording it as well, which will be published on our blog. So you will be able to see it afterwards and we would like to hear from you as well. So please ask questions throughout. There is a questions box on the right hand side of the screen. So if you just pop your questions in there and then we'll hopefully answer them at the end. But if we don't, we will follow up with a written reply. So moving on, um, as I said, even though we aren't at Google HQ, we have uh, we are still going to hear directly from them, which brings me on to introduce our first speaker, Sam Craggs. He is our agency development manager at Google, and he is going to be giving you some key insights around Google's market data for real money gambling. And then you're going to hear from our PPC director, uh, receptional Matt Lachlan. He's going to be highlighting recent trends during the pandemic, and he's going to be teaching you about best practice and getting your fundamentals right. So I'm going to stop talking now and hand, hand you over to Sam to talk about real money gambling. OK, hi, everyone. Nice to, nice to see you all. Um, so yeah, my name is Sam Craggs. I'm an agency development manager here at Google. Um, so I've been at Google for around four years now, um, and that has been in the agency team for all that period, working with lots of um, large independent agencies uh, throughout that. So have a good, uh, very good experience from that. And um, prior to Google, I also worked agency side as well for a few years, and also as a PPC client manager um, as well, another online e-commerce company. So nice varied background there. So um, the agenda for today, we are going to firstly look at the overall market view and um, for what's been happening um, in the gambling and gaming industry over the last few years. Um, secondly, we're going to look at the Google market data. So the first part is more like third party um, with a good mixture of external sources, whereas the Google market is what we see internally. Um, and then finally, we're going to look at some more up to date data. Um, so as you can imagine, with the the uh, the pandemic that unfortunately we're experiencing right now, um, there hasn't there's been a bit of a pivot of resource. So a lot of the um, the more up to date data that we'd expect to see at this period isn't quite ready yet. So um, the initial uh, market and Google data view is going to be um, more so 2018, 2019. But then we do have that um, latest March update. Okay. Cool. So. What has been happening generally in the industry? Um, on a macro level, um, consumer spending has been generally increasing um, over the last few years. Um, so the betting and slot segment both grew more than 19% um, in, in 2018 um, and generated 80% of all online gambling revenue. So it shows how important there. Um, technology has really, really improved across um, various gambling companies recently. And um, they have been able to analyze consumer spending habits in a far more um, detailed manner and have been um, getting significantly more um, intelligent in the way that they will market and advertise and moving forwards. Um, and then finally, one of the other biggest um, macro trends is really that pivot to um, mobile. In the past, where it would have been more of this kind of 50 50 split that we might see in uh, other industries. In gambling, we're looking at maybe upwards of like 80% of, um, of gambling going on the mobile devices, which is an incredible stat. So. Um, how much have people been spending on gambling? Um, customers' expenditure in the UK grew 12.6% um, year on year in 2018, which is a really, really strong increase. And that's um, a kind of like mixture of the um, the best and the worst case coming from Mintel there. But as you can see, over the next few years, um, we would have really expected that to continue. As you'll see later on, um, that's certainly been impacted by the corona pandemic. Um, but hopefully once all this is over, then we would like to see that trend continue running forwards. 
Okay. Um, so traditionally, gambling, as you'll be aware, would have been much more of a like in casino um, and in betting shop um, activity. Uh, whereas we've seen a huge, huge pivot um, in the to the online markets now, which is really interesting to see. Um, online's actually become one of the most prevalent. Um, and gamblers are really switching from the high street to the internet. Um, and actually, the most important um, statistic to see now, especially in those younger, um, the younger generations, the first, the first way people will gamble now is online rather than just going to a casino or a betting shop the first time, which would have been the case normally. Um, so as I said before, where's the main increase in this overall gambling industry, what we're seeing? Um, so betting and slots have been the key area. Um, they grew by more than 19% in value, so that's total investment over the last uh, the last year. Um, and a huge, obviously a huge part of that was the World Cup in 2018, um, increased football's contribution massively, uh, especially in the UK as well. You know, um, England did perform quite well during that period, so that certainly had an impact there. Um, so as I said before, um, mobile remains like the main um, area that people are um, are gambling right now. So for those queries, which are the intent, so like gamble now, like putting in um, check the latest odds, things like that, we're seeing 76% of those queries come through um, smartphone um, for the younger generation, which is really a, um, a huge change in how we're seeing things change there. So as we know, the, the younger generation is, um, is is uh, one of the ones which is far more um, far more focused on the on the mobile device on these. So, 69% of remote um, gamblers had their first gaming experience of or betting experience online, which is huge, as opposed to that 18%, which would have gone to the shop, casino, or bingo club that you've seen before. So, it's it's, it's very indicative of where the industry has continued to go. Um, another interesting factor is actually the um, the number of accounts that we're seeing people have before. Um, so. Just under half of gamblers held one online account, um, and younger gamblers were actually more likely to hold more than five accounts. So as you can see there, 17% of those aged 24 to 34 held, held five or more accounts, which is really interesting. Um, I think this has actually been pivoting a little bit more um, the other way recently, as the kind of like the movement towards like the free bet, the free bets, and um, those like those cashback offers were certainly um, brought back in value by a lot of the um, the gambling customers, but it's still obviously very prevalent. So what is the most important factor um, for um, gamblers when they select who they're actually going to gamble with? Um, unsurprisingly, best odds comes out at top with 26% um, in first place. Um, but then one thing which I thought was very key to note on here is actually the second reason, which is the reputation of company for being fair and trustworthy. Um, again, you would have thought that these like the most uh, the cheapest odds and the best free bets were were very important. But the fact that this comes up second, that the reputation that you are going to get paid on time is really important. So um, what that really emphasizes to us is that the, the brand equity um, and the brand awareness is a really key, important area. So we need to ensure that we are growing these um, effectively in the right way. So um, e-gaming is where, um, as we said before, a huge amount of the growth has, has started to come through. Um, so this is like a combination of things. This could be maybe um, online lottery, online slots, um, bingo, the um, football pools, poker, things like that. Um, this is where we are seeing a huge development and a huge increase in volume. So as you can see there, in, um, in the 2018 growth in casino especially, that was 30%, which is an enormous rise and something we're not seeing across any of the other categories. Take water. And um, when it comes to the casino and being games, consumers definitely prefer um, the the real thing. Five percent of Brits have visited a UK casino in the past twelve months, while one percent have played casino games online. So I think what's interesting here is when we although it's certainly um, increasing the use of um, the online casinos on there, a lot of pe you, people are still far more likely to go into a UK casino as it um, maybe treats the more um, casual gamer as opposed to the more serious one on there. So what else do online bettors like to do? Um, as you can imagine at Google, we get a huge amount of data on um, consumers, how they spend um, how they spend their time online and what kind of games then they play. Um, Mainstream gaming can really top up this player pool, so it's very interesting when you have people that are first more likely to play puzzles, word games, adventure, and um, they are also more increasingly likely to be online betters. So this is maybe when you are looking to expand your um, audiences within um, 
uh, across online. They, normally, you might have been looking for in-market audiences of people that have only maybe um, gambled before or have, have already an interest in sports on that. However, you might actually find there's a lot more out there um, to find in um, people who are just doing general mo uh, mobile online gaming. You know, people that um, would be buying tokens and like increased lives on some of the gaming apps. It's, it's interesting to note that. And as you can see there, the stat as well, um, non-gambling games have significant p potential being played by 84% of online bettors. So um, the correlation there is, is really hard to argue against. So um, sports book when it comes to purely gambling on sporting activity. Um, have you participated online activity? Um, it stayed pretty much the same um, year on year. There hasn't been too much growth across the um, the shift of people between yes and no on there, but still 70% um, of those, um, the gambling report um, from Mintel last there had um, participated online um, gaming. Um, where's most of the time going? Unsurprisingly, again, football, 20%, um, horse racing, 14%. We would expect that to have changed this year with Cheltenham and everything else and um, that has, has just gone on there and the increases, um, but still those uh, have, been, have been growing very strongly. Um, in third place, something to note on that is eSports. Um, this is certainly an area that over the last year or so, um, it has really started to grow. So as you can see there, we didn't even have 2017 data for eSports. So there's a 5% um, of people have done an esports during that time. So we are expecting that to grow with the growth in things like Twitch and um, YouTube gaming. It's just becoming more and more popular. So we'd expect to see that continue. Um, just moving on to the next one. So, um, also, um, why do people gamble? Um, this was done on a participation awareness um, survey um, from the UK Gambling Commission. And I thought it was very interesting that 45% is still to win. 29% um, for fun and uh, 18 to win big, good causes as a hobby. Um, the fact is to win 45% is still the most important, it's very, very clear. So that's the overall um, third party market view on there. So we're gonna actually turn to the internal ga uh, Google data. So um, the mobile desktop gap is widening. As I said before, um, it's often been um, the pinnacle of the mobile performance on uh, on gambling already. Um, but the level of growth that we've seen of this last year itself there, that's from like the um, halfway through 2017 towards 19, it's constantly gaining more and more mobile spot and desktop is being used even less. Um, so we will continue, we will expect that to continue over the coming, um, over the coming years for sure. Um, we're seeing a big, big, big growth in interest in gambling and um, 90 million queries per month. Um, is our latest data from that one from January 19, which is an 8% year-on-year growth. And on YouTube as well, which is um, a really interesting one, um, 5 million queries per month for gambling-related terms in there, which is a huge growth. So this might be very from um, people searching up um, gambling advertisements, and might be people searching for betting advice, everything like that. So what specifically within Google are we seeing the biggest growth in? Lotteries, again, is, is one of the strongest. Um, we would expect the same to be um, for sports betting and horse and dog uh, horse racing. We also include dogs there, sorry, as well. But lotteries is really where we're seeing the biggest growth. Also, um, consumers behavior is changing um, as we will see with um, a lot of uh, a, a lot of different um, categories of things like um, restaurants and retail, things are far more about free delivery net right now, things near me, things immediately, things quickly. That's certainly the, the same thing that we are seeing in the gambling gambling industry. So lotto results tonight, today's racing results, horse racing cars today, Euro million results today. Um, so it's very important that you have this like broad, expansive um, reach, especially for um, pay search for all these um, for all these like broader terms when people might be searching for um, for this like immediate um, action on the gambling. So three other fundamental trends. Um, players are confused and try to make sense of it all. As you can imagine, the, um, there's already a really key um, gambling base within um, within all of our products, but um, where we are expect to see a lot of growth to those more casual gamers and um, things like Grand National, Cheltenham, things like that, something that will attract the, the less seasoned gambler. Um, sometimes they find it very confusing. So we're seeing a big in increase in um, actually querying the jargon. Um, so what does draw no bet mean? What's a Yankee bet? Um, how to bet on a Grand National? All of these which are more likely to appeal to the um, more amateur gambler, the less experienced one. Again, 
what what um, advertisers might have done traditionally is really look for those um, free bet account keywords, those um, really direct response like get a, an account opened up now, get a bet done right now. Um, however, one thing you, if you do that, you're missing out on a huge audience of all the people who are less experienced in, in this area. Uh, area. So um, this is something that you really absolutely certainly need coverage on. Um, desperate for help, um, betting sites, betting tips, all through Google and YouTube, um, betting tips, betting on zero, match betting, spread betting. Um, also, as well, as I said before, um, where a huge increase in that YouTube exposure for gambling is, is people offering advice and important um, recommendations for things like what to do on the online casinos, how to play better at poker, um, there's a real big market for this right now, something that we would expect to see growth over the, over the coming years. So gambling is not only about playing, it's also about watching. Um, a familiar phenomenon. Um, what we see in, in gaming, um, the trend has absolutely hugely changed towards um, people watching Fortnite, watching Minecraft, watching um, uh, all, all of those kind of games and Call of Duty, like the War Zones, um, and actually streaming those the whole time rather than that people actually playing themselves. Um, and it's called like Let's Play or Walkthroughs. So this is things that are becoming really, really um, popular in the esports world. So something to bear in mind um, as we expect to see more gambling uh, enter that industry. Um, also very interesting, people are fascinated by um, winners. Some of the biggest increases we've seen are people seeing the news categories for people that have won recently. So Andrew Clark there, a huge Euro Millions winner. Um, Michael Carroll, National Lottery winner, won multi-millions um, uh, of dollars um, of in the US. Um, and people obviously have those spikes. I've seen the news articles. There could be opportunity there and covering those top um, sorts of areas. Finally, um, the ongoing diversification, new bets and new audiences. Um, Politics and celebrity news are subjects to bets. There was um, increased things with like Love Island on who would win that. Um, more recently, we had huge decisions like no deal Brexit, um, second referendum, um, things like that, which are people are constantly checking the odds and seeing there as an opportunity to really make some money on things that previously would never have been bet before. Um, another interesting one, which we saw um, more last, uh, last year was Royal Baby gender bet, something that I would never know that you would normally um, be able to gamble on uh, myself. But that's certainly something that the users were looking for. Um, traditionally, we'd have expected to see that um, that um, male gamblers um, were far more prevalent than female gamblers, uh, and this still is the case. Um, but certainly, in terms of the overall sports audiences, we see um, that up to like over sorry over a third of the sports audience is women. So again, when looking at previous old um, historical data, you might have been seeing that men is the key demographic for your business. Um, the female view, especially on the sports book, is only going to grow and grow and grow. Um, as you will see there as well, on um, there's even difference between the sports, so it's really trying to work out what is right um, for each each sport. Soccer is still got a significantly low um, low low challenge from um, from women, sorry, um, as opposed to rugby, which attracts significantly more women for that. So again, looking at things like new areas as well, 888 ladies login, pink casino, even these entire businesses that are more pivoted um, towards the female gambler are something that's certainly an opportunity for something that for a company which may only be, um, have been purely male um, dominated before. So I think also that 88 ladies logging there, I didn't say that before, 667% growth year on year. Some, it's rare that you see like a number um, of something that comes out like that unless it's like a breaking news query. So to see that level of growth, it really shows the, um, the, the change that we're starting to see. So just to summarize that section, um, so players are confused and trying to make sense of it all. So make it simple. So again, if you are to if you run a gambling or a gaming business, um, it needs to be clear, it needs to be easy. Um, again, you've probably got that really key user base um, already. Um, if you want the new untapped um, consumers, ensure that you are making um, making everything simple, Make uh, in include things like glossaries, information, what it all means. Um, gambling is not only about playing, it's about watching. We fully expect that trend to continue. Um, so make it relatable um, and keep in touch with those modern trends. Um, and yeah, ongoing diversifications, make it personal. Um, if we see continue to see this trend of the, the female um, gamblers uh, penetrate uh, the the audience. Ensure that you are covering that section, not making it like a two male dominated site or male dominated user design, for example. 
Um, so this is something that I um, literally received um, this morning. So um, we actually have some March data and um, there isn't a huge amount to share, unfortunately, um, right now. Again, as you can imagine, the, the analysts um, are working on, on lots of different things at the moment, um, but can share some, some early, early trends that we're seeing. Um, so just from Q4, um, queries um, are still growing, which is great to see, um, the majority in, um, in mobile. As unsurprisingly, across like most industries, um, the tablet has got a huge decline there, 25%, as people are more pivoting towards using those mobile devices a lot more. Um, and funnily uh, and interestingly enough as well, um, the CPCs also seen a 21% drop across the board. Um, so despite there being that increase in right now, the, the level of competition um, is still increasing with ad depth, but the overall CPC has become cheaper, which is good to see. Um, so one interesting thing, we, we had something come through very recently from Cheltenham. Um, so as you can imagine during Cheltenham, that the sports book on the on the horse racing gambling is um, is very prominent and you would always expect those huge spikes there. One thing that we did see this year that was perhaps more unexpected was that e-gaming queries really complemented this um, in the evenings after horse racing. So let's just say that people were um, gambling during the day on the horses and they would still be wanting to gamble and game more in the evening. So it's almost like they um, had had gained the um, the desire to, to continue for the rest of the day. So in the evenings after that, there is certainly opportunity for e-gaming clients, for lotteries, casinos, everything like that. Um, there was certainly opportunity there, which might have been missed out. So certainly over these, um, when when these kind of events uh, return, um, there's definitely opportunity in in the uh, in the hours post these. Um, and out of these, where was most of the time done? It was actually bingo, um, funnily enough, which had the, the biggest increase. Casino and poker um, was still important in horse racing for like the next day, um, but bingo was the most uh, was the most common. So just some general um, search trends from EMEA, what we're seeing. Um, again, um, unsurprisingly, football has seen the biggest decline um, over the last few weeks. This goes up to the 23rd of March there, since the suspension of, of multiple football seasons. Um, we've seen a 92% drop in football, horse racing not as affected, surprisingly. I think a, a few were still running up until later in the day. Um, but there is like some green shoots there of the poker and casinos, 27% year on year rise, which is which is actually huge. Slots and bingo as well, 42%. So certainly still opportunity there um, in these other games. Um, sports betting, UK and Ireland. Um, as a total year on year query change, we've seen the 13% in the UK. And you can really see that huge decline since the um, the 14th of March there on the left hand graph, just to where we're at now um, in that index general sports betting trends. So um, next, poker and casino. So just wanted to um, delve a little bit deeper on poker and casino um, because when people are, um, when there is not no sports event required and when people are more um, confined to their own households, um, we're certainly seeing a increase in desire to play um, poker online and go into casinos online. Um, and you can see on this, the year on year over search increase on the right, which I think makes it a little bit clearer. Um, you've got Italy, Austria and Spain and Ireland um, there, some of the um, nations which were um, quicker to have um, more, uh, how to describe it, um, more uh, isolation and um, maybe stricter rules in place. I've actually seen the biggest growth in these. So Italy has been obviously one of the unfortunately significantly affected areas um, and that's had a huge increase um, in, in um, interest in poker and casino, uh, 43%. And that's pretty much the same across the board, but even um, the UK is right now, it's gone to a, a similar, um, Similar request from the government of people um, staying inside. Um, it's actually almost a third of what was um, what we're seeing in that increase in in, in Italy. Cool. And um, that's everything I had from the latest trend. So I'm just going to hand over to Matt now on what um, what to do next. Brilliant. Thanks, Sam. <clears throat> Some really interesting insights in that presentation. Um, I think, as you mentioned, it would be good to see the final 2019 insights once they're released um, as well. Um, hopefully once we return to a degree of normality. So hopefully everyone can hear me and see my screen. Can I just check with you, Max? Yeah, we're good. Excellent, brilliant. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining um, and, and thanks for Sam for that update there. Um, just a quick note before we dive in. So we've adjusted the content very slightly on the comms that some of you um, will have seen. Um, 
um, simply really in response to obviously recent events. Um, so what this means is that video and display are now covered uh, in separate webinars. Uh, but in terms of today, we'll be focusing on search and the opportunities to get you ahead uh, during the current crisis. Uh, we've got a few polls for you um, within this as well, just to get a bit of interactivity from it, just to get a bit of feedback as to where you're up to uh, and kind of what your struggles are so that we can tailor some of the future content to you as well. So just before we get cracking, just a bit about me. So my name is Matt Lachlan. I head up the, the, the paid search team um, at Receptional. Um, we work on search display, uh, social ads and video. So I've been working in PPC for over 12 years now. Uh, and speak regularly at Google HQ for seminars such as this uh, and other conferences as well. Uh, and in terms of me personally, uh, I'm a West Ham season ticket holder, um, so I'm, I'm not a successful better because I tend to bet with my heart rather than my head. <laughs> um, and I have two young children, so similar to Max. Um, if, you, if you hear any screaming in the background, apologies for that now. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping that it's kept to a minimum. Um, and then just in terms of the campaigns that I've worked on and clients, so people like BetDAC and others uh, for, for campaigns ranging from exchange betting, uh, sportsbook, bingo, casino, uh, and that's really since early 2009 as well. So I've been doing it for a fair while. So just diving in um, and looking a bit about the kind of the pre-crisis PR and regulation. So obviously before the current crisis, it, it, was, it, was, it was tough for us out there. We're all seen as the bad guys. Uh, you know, it's been harder to operate recently and margins have been squeezed. And I think it's fair to say that marketing, especially when it comes to PPC for player acquisition, is very expensive. So when we ran this event at Google in October last year, we were asked specifically if we could focus uh, some of our next activity on slots uh, and more so lean towards search, uh, simply because many people do struggle to, uh, to make the slots activity work for them um, in light of kind of the challenges um, faced by the industry and, and, and sort of the cost behind it, which we'll come into as well. But just in terms of the size of the market, so again, uh, some data from 2018 from the, from Intel, the Gambling Commission um, pre-crisis. So back to, going back to 2017, 2018, we were looking at a slots market worth about two billion a year. Uh, and that's forecast to increase over the course of five years uh, by 55% to just over 3.1 billion. Uh, in 2022-2023. And as Sam already mentioned in his data, uh, the betting and slot segments both grew by more than 19% in value during 2017 and 18. Uh, and between the two of them, they're generating just under 80% of all gambling revenue in the year as well. So a huge opportunity um, to be looking at slots moving forward. And obviously recent events are likely to accelerate that as well. And then just looking at volume and competition. So I mean, unsurprisingly to many of you that are running slots activity, you can see that it's very, very expensive. Uh, so I'm sure that the seasonality here won't surprise many of you. Uh, but when it comes to the actual CPCs themselves, when we're looking at all of the top terms, we can see that the average top of page bid across all of those terms is around 1456. So it's very, very expensive. And then just looking at some more recent trends, so what's happening recently, um, specifically at March data from the 9th of March to 28th of March and what's happening. Uh, so what we've seen recently um, is that, as again, as Sam has mentioned, as I'm sure we're all aware really, sports betting has, has obviously tailed off um, given the pausing of many seasons uh, or the cancellation of seasons, um, unless of course you want to focus on betting on the Belarusian Premier League or the Angolan Football League like me um, unsuccessfully. Um, but it does present certain opportunities. As Sam said, there's green shoots uh, and they look like uh, online slots, for example, which is the enlarged gray line on that chart, casino and poker as well. But just looking at slots, just to kind of uh, build this picture up a bit more so, what have we seen recently? Well, if you look at the, uh, the keywords that we've got on this table here, uh, these are the top uh, search interest keywords for slots um, based on average monthly searches. And you can see the pre-pandemic bid, which is essentially a snapshot of how that bid looked at, towards the end of 2019 uh, and how the bids look as of last week for that as well. So yes, volumes have increased, but the competition has increased as of course, uh, the operators have jumped on the opportunity to recruit more players. So we've seen the bids increase on average from just over 21 pounds to just over 40 pounds. So 90% increase overall. So it's very, very expensive um, and, and essentially what, 
what that means for us as advertisers is that we really need to focus on how can we get the most from those CPCs and how can we reduce our CPCs because they will be different by advertiser. And then just looking at recent device changes, so uh, some interesting data from Global Web Index uh, released last week uh, for March 2020 um, on trends and device trends during the crisis. Uh, and what that's shown us is that mobile device usage or smartphone usage has increased by 70% um, in the last month. Um, so whilst we've been talking for a long time about being mobile first and the importance of mobile, um, it's clearly now more, more important than ever uh, to be mobile first and to make sure that we're offering experiences that are really well suited uh, to mobile device users. Um, and as I mentioned, we've got a couple of polls for you today. So this brings us to our first poll. Um, and the first poll, if I can ask you just to all, all fill this in, uh, as you can see on screen, um, is which of these campaign types um, presents the biggest challenge to you at present? So your search activity, your display activity, your video activity, or your social ads activity. And I'll just launch that poll now. And then hopefully you will all see this on screen. Uh, and if I could just give 30 <laughs> seconds or so for people to fill this in. And at the minute the poll is collecting responses, um, I'll give a bit of a countdown as we get a bit close to the time. And then, as I said, the, the idea being really that behind these polls, we can just get a bit of uh, a bit of an understanding as to the current challenges that people are facing so that we can tailor some of the content a bit more to you as well. So responses are coming in, 63% of people voted. So I'll just give it 10 more seconds for some more people to vote uh, and then we'll close that poll off and share the results with everyone. Great, so I'll just give it five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Excellent, right, so I'll close that poll off now and share the results of people on screen. And hopefully you can all see that 82% of you um, are struggling with search at the minute, which is good because that's what we're talking about today. Um, but video and social ads also present an issue, um, which is good because we, 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 we have uh, uh, some webinars coming up to help with that, which Max will talk about after as well. Excellent, right, so I will now go back to sharing my screen and hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yeah, all good. Brilliant, okay, good stuff. So getting the fundamentals right during the crisis. So we've just had a quick look at, at how the demand has increased, uh, but also how expensive uh, it can be as well. So what can we do to ensure that we're most effective on search um, in the, at the current time? So for us, I think our philosophy as an agency really is, is about the aggregation of marginal gains. So it's essentially the reason I've got a picture of Team GB uh, on screen, um, for those of you listening, uh, is essentially it's the, it's the same philosophy that was introduced to the team by Dave Brailsford, the performance director of Team GB. Um, and it's about searching for a tiny margin of improvement in everything that you do. And the idea being that if you get 1% better each day for a year, you'll end up 37 times better by the time you're done. And that's how we work and that's how we approach uh, our PPC activity um, to ensure that we're squeezing the 1% out of all the different elements that would form an advertising account um, when the costs are so high um, and the gains uh, are potentially huge as well. But where do those marginal gains come from? Well, for us, we have a tool that we've created in-house called Expert Eye, um, and that looks at 146 best practices across 10 core areas. So those core areas, as you can see on screen, from landing pages to ad copy to audiences, et cetera, et cetera. Now, today, we're just gonna be focusing on three of those areas and just a few points from each of those three areas. So just a few points uh, for ad copy audiences and keyword strategy as well. Um, and that's based on, on the, some of the audits that we do for people using the Expert Eye tool. So more recently, some of the issues that we've seen and what we think will be most relevant to people listening. So the biggest issues, what are they? Well, firstly, keyword quality scores. Uh, secondly, audience targeting. And thirdly, uh, creating effective ad copy. So firstly, just looking at keyword quality scores. So when we look at our keyword strategy uh, as a part of our expert eye audits, we look at 13 key areas and keyword quality scores is just one of those, uh, but it's the area that we see most opportunity with when we tend to look at gambling accounts. Um, um, so just a bit of a rundown on keyword quality scores. Um, so a lot of people think that uh, sort of 
cost per click prices are determined by the auction. Um, and yes, that's that's partly true, of course. Uh, you know, we, we set a bid, but at the same time, uh, behind every keyword that we used, uh, a quality score is assigned by the system of between one and 10. And that score heavily determines the cost per click that we um, we need to pay um, to be in a certain position. And of course, when we're talking about gambling, we're talking about very high CPCs. So if we're just looking at the example on screen for play slots online, the top of page high range bid for that, uh, the time of putting this deck together was 7550. Um, so it's very, very expensive. And what we know is that our quality scores are important because they form our ad rank, which determines where we sit as advertisers. Um, and ultimately what this means is that, yes, you can be bidding more than somebody else, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you will be in the top spot. So for example, in this instance, or this example, I should say on the left-hand side, it could be that the person in second place is paying the, the average price for that keyword that we just looked at, 75.50, uh, but somebody above them is paying less simply because their quality score is stronger. Um, so this you know, quality score has been around for a while. It's nothing new, but at the same time, it's something that tends to be um, looked at, not enough, I would say, uh, by most advertisers. Um, but why look at this? Well, I think it's, to, to put it into context, there's a, a, a simulation on screen uh, for the example keyword online slots. Now, if we're just assuming that this has an eight out of 10 quality score, um, we're looking at say 27,100 average monthly searches, a click-through rate of just under 7%, and that would amount to an opportunity to attract just over 1,800 clicks. Now, if we're looking at a CPC bid of about 75 pounds for this particular keyword, that would cost us over 138,000 pounds a month. But what we know is from this, the quality score data and the improvements in quality scores, uh, is that if we improve an eight out of 10 quality score to a nine out of 10, that would typically deliver a saving of about 11.1%. So in this instance, just working to improve that keyword from an eight to a nine would save about 15,000 pounds. And that's from one keyword per month. So that's a significant opportunity if we're looking across all of our keywords uh, to be reducing our costs. And Matt, can I just ask, is this is this new data for advertisers, just as, as you mentioned, quality scores have been around for quite a while? That's right, Max. So quality scores have been around for a long time. So a lot of people are probably sitting there wondering why, why I'm talking about kind of old hat stuff in a sense. Uh, so quality scores have been around for a while, um, but it, it tends to be data that's tucked away within the report. So people don't tend to look at it um, enough from our experience. Um, what is newer behind the quality score data um, are kind of the component metrics to it, which I'm coming on to in a minute. And there's three component metrics, and actually that probably seg segues me quite nicely into that. So with quality score within <clears throat> the Google Ads platform, excuse me, um, we can see the actual quality scores for each individual keyword. Um, and then we can also see scores for each of the three component metrics that comprise quality score. So the three metrics being expected CTR, ad relevance, and landing page experience. Um, and we get an, a score for those of below average, average or above average for each of those metrics. So we can essentially create action plans um, for each and every keyword um, on the basis that we know those scores. Um, when we're looking at quality scores in this instance here, we're just looking at well, the first thing I should say that we're going to look at is landing page experience. Uh, and when we're looking at landing page experience, this largely means landing page speed time. Um, or page load speed time, I should say, um, specifically for mobile devices as well. So there's really three compelling reasons why you should be focusing on improving um, the, the speed of your landing pages. Now, firstly, as I said, it's a core component of quality score with Google Ads. So if it can negatively affect your quality score, uh, it also affects your conversion rates, as, as you would expect, and it can affect your organic rankings as well. So you know, after two and a half seconds, we see a 50% drop in conversions typically. So some very compelling reasons why we need to make sure that we're speeding up performance, especially on mobile devices. Um, and what we've done is just benchmark um, some load speeds for different slots landing pages for when we put this data together, which was uh, at sort of the tail end of February. And what we can see from this is for the different operators, you can see the difference in the speed index and the, and, and the time it takes for that page to become interactive. So the speed index um, is, is how quickly the contents of a page are visibly populated. And the time to interactive is just the amount of time it takes for, for the page to become fully interactive for a user. And we can see here that Admiral, Unibet and Aspers were quickest when we were simulating a, a 4G connection here. 
um, but still it was clear that all of those operators still could be looking to to speed up that experience for mobile users and of course at the minute we're seeing an increase in in mobile traffic uh, we're seeing the next generation of customers prefer to use mobile devices so two reasons there um, and, and, uh, and some interesting information last week released by global uh, web index as well which which showed us that um, you know, toilet roll isn't <laughs> sort of necessarily the the big thing that's being rationed at the minute bandwidth is also an issue uh, I think we've all heard that um, yeah, the internet is slightly collapsing under the strain of unprecedented usage with with companies like Netflix um, downgrading uh, the quality of streaming just to cope with the demand. Uh, Facebook have reported surges on normal days that are beyond the main annual spike they would see on New Year's Eve. So this is slowing things down for many people as well. So I think when we're looking at speeding things up, we really need to be looking to cater uh, for the slowest possible devices as well just to ensure that we can maximize quality scores our conversion rates and our organic rankings as well in terms of how we do that so google lighthouse is a good tool um and obviously we we tend to favor this simply because we know it's this it's google's data that's driving the ad side of things as well so um google lighthouse will highlight opportunities to speed things up and that's something that's good to share with developers um just in terms of looking at the opportunities um, that are listed in priority order and how much time it might save in terms of load speeds as I said so that we can cater to the slowest connections so three tips for quality score uh, for those listening so firstly I would recommend that you get a quality score overview if you don't have one or don't have a recent one from your team or from your agency um, and then I would also recommend that you look to create action plans off the component scores for quality score as well so not just look at the keyword quality scores for each individual keyword but the core metrics that comprise those scores for each keyword as well um, so that you can tailor some action plans to do something about them and to improve them and then thirdly third tip would be to check your site speed your landing page speeds using google lighthouse and see how you can speed those up work with your developers uh, to see how you can speed up those pages because right now that will really pay dividends and then just moving on to our second area, which is audience targeting. Um, now we're often asked, like, you know, what, what options are available to us? We're in a sensitive category. We can't use remarketing. Um, we can't use customer match data with Google Ads because it's a sensitive category. So, so what can we do? Um, well, there are three sort of main options really that tend to be underused by this sector. So we're going to look at those, uh, each of those in turn now. Um, but before we do, I just want to show everyone who's listening, kind of give you an idea of, of, of what Google knows about us. So these are just four screenshots of many, many more um, from my own Google Ads settings, from my own Google account, showing what Google knows about me and how ads are personalized to me based on what it knows about my demographics, my interests, the sites I visit, my browsing behavior, etc. And as you can see, it, it it knows a lot. And as I said, this is just a fraction um, of, the, of the data that's available within my ad settings as well. So I think when we remind ourselves that platforms like Google, like Facebook, have more data on us than anyone else in human history, we can see why certain audiences can be so effective for us as advertisers. So firstly, just looking at detailed demographics. So we've seen some shifting behaviors in the report that, that Sam presented in, 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 in Google's data, and there's clearly opportunity, uh, but we need to see this in action for our own advertising as well. So as Google's building up a profile of us, uh, we need to see that data reflected in our campaign reports so that we can see how different audiences respond to us beyond the more typical demographic data that we had within advertising platforms, such as just age and just gender. We need to see uh, people's level of education, kind of the, the size of employer that they work for, whether they're homeowners or renters, whether they're, they're single or married, the sectors they work in, etc. as well. Um, it's worth mentioning that some of these aren't available yet in the UK. So household income is available in certain markets, um, but not yet available in the UK. But that may change in future. Um, and obviously, if it does, that, that could be very interesting data to, to see within our campaigns and to target our campaigns as well. And then moving on to in-market audiences. So in-market audiences, huge, huge amounts of data um, on individual Google users looking at their search behavior, 
um, looking at the sites that they visit to analyze the behavioral signals and determine when somebody is in the market for a particular product or service. That now extends to over 500 categories, um, over 500 products and services. And what it means for us is that we can build up a picture of those that are more likely to play slots. So with people that we've been working with, for example, we may see that those that are more interested in, say, first class travel, um, equate to more first time depositors and higher value players as well. Similarly, similarly we have affinity audiences uh, for search now as well. So these were only added to search campaigns or the possibility of, of adding these to search campaigns only appeared in November last year. Um, but there are now 130 affinity audiences that we can set as observations to our search campaigns um, before bidding based on performance as well. So if we just go back to Sam's data and we look at the Gambling Insights report from tw for 2019, the Mintel report, we could see um, that gamers were more likely to be betters. So if we're looking at um, affinity audiences of, of those that are interested in sports games, for example, the ability to bid up or down on, on, on certain audiences could be very, very powerful for us uh, once we've accumulated enough data to make a, a, a data-driven decision. Um, Matt, just to be clear for our um, for our attendees on the affinity audiences, are the audiences yes. that they can target, are they direct audiences specifically for gambling? Uh, so there's nothing specifically for gambling. So, for example, then there aren't in-market audiences for people that are in the market for, say, slots or casino or poker or whatever it may be. Um, there's nothing mm -hmm. provided like that. Um, but as I said, within market audiences, there's over 500 audiences of people that are just in the market for different products and services. And if we apply all of those audiences to our campaigns as observations, what we can see is, OK, what's the correlation between all of those audiences and our campaigns? How many people are in the market for certain products and services and search for slots as well? So we can use that for our bidding strategies. Mm -hmm. So some really okay. um, key audience signals for, for sort of bidding. Does that make okay, sense? That's great. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Excellent. OK, which leads me to sort of the wrap up slide on, on, on audience signals, really. And we can see here how this should look now. So within 2020, as I said, we've, we've, we've looked at sort of keyword quality scores and the fact that keywords, even in 2020, still form the foundation of, of modern paid search counts. But at the same time, we now have the ability to layer, lay, layer on detailed demographic data, as we can see on the example on the left of the screen with in-market audience and affinity data on the right-hand side to ensure that we're feeding in many, many signals into the system uh, for our bidding strategy so that we can maximize our conversion rates and reduce our cost per acquisitions as well. So three tips um, for those when it comes to using audiences. So firstly, just at the minute, I would, I would recommend that you check what audiences you're using uh, to enhance your keyword targeting. So we, again, within our audiences, it's common to either see that audiences are not being used at all, um, or a, a, a very small selection of the available audiences are being used when it comes to uh, in-market audiences, affinity audiences, and detailed demographics. And then our second tip would be to add them all as observations to build data. So you can essentially set up your campaign so that you ask the system to uh, silo the data so it, it will show you the data for those that are interested in say sports uh, playing sports games and then uh, playing slots um, just so you can build that data up over time you can see what's happening you can of course use that to inform your other marketing activities as well uh, but then you can ultimately use that to uh, to automate your bidding um, and, and to make your bidding more effective as well And then finally, just moving on to creating effective ads. So our, our final set of tips for search activity. So why look at creating effective ads? Well, if we just go back to the, the, the component scores for, or the component metrics for quality score, uh, we're talking about expected CTR uh, and ad relevance, the two areas we haven't really covered. Um, now looking at ad copy covers sort of those first two elements. Um, but specifically today, we wanted to look at mobile ads. Um, so of all the things that we could focus on, why focus on mobile ads? Well, pre-crisis, we know from, from our work in the sector that sort of 75% of traffic from mobile is, is pretty common. Um, and of course, recently that's increased uh, in, in light of the current situation. Um, secondly, again, going back to, to Sam's data and to what he mentioned, um, 18 to 24 year olds, the younger generation are more likely to have their first gambling experience online uh, and are more likely to use mobile devices as well. 
So your future generation of customers are using these devices. They want to be on these devices. That's how they want to engage with you. So for us, it's very, very important to make sure that we get not only the landing page right and the uh, and, and sort of the load times, but also the copy um, to attract the clicks in the first place. So if we're just looking at um, uh, some tips for copy. So firstly, um, one of our, our first tips that, that again comes out of off the back of our audits in terms of what's underused, uh, our first tip would be device specific ads. And what we mean by that is essentially creating ads for different devices with device friendly calls to action as well. So in the example that you can see on screen for the two advertisers here, uh, you can see that the text in the ads is actually truncated. Um, and, and the reason that that is the case is that uh, advertisers are still creating um, ads for desktop devices and not focusing enough on creating ads for mobile devices. So then the way that we would do that is to create if functions that would say if the, if the traffic is coming from mobile, we display uh, a shorter ad, we display a different call to action, we speak to people on mobile devices so that it's clear that we understand they're on a mobile and that they know that they're going to get a good experience as well. And then our second tip really will come down to um, ad extensions uh, and what's most underused um, as well. And again, specifically on mobile. So obviously on mobile devices, we have fewer ads, we have smaller screens, um, making mobile ad extensions more important. Um, and we know um, that Google not only um, sort of rewards those that use um, ad extensions and all the available extensions, but it penalizes those that don't as well. So we need to add and test all available ad extensions um, to ensure that we can maximize the clicks and maximize our quality score as well. So the two most underused ad extensions are, as you can see on screen, the first one on the left hand side would be the promotion extensions, which can show an offer uh, within the actual ad. And the second one would be price extensions as well, um, which enlarge the ad quite considerably as well uh, and have a good effect on click through rate. So something to really check that you're using at the current time. And then th our third ad extension would be the app extensions. So some interesting data that we've seen from Apps Flyer uh, in the last week again is that uh, year on year app installs are up 15% during the current crisis and gaming is up 7% globally at the end of March as well. So if you've got an app, now is the time to make sure that your app extensions are present within your ads and we're not seeing very much of this at the moment. Um, and then point number four, isn't an ad extension, but it's related to to uh, to the use of apps, and that would relate to universal app campaigns. So again, if you've got an app at the present time, uh, given the growth that we're seeing with app installs and engagement, now would be the time to promote your app via universal app campaigns or UACs. So our tips for improving ads. So firstly, test shorter uh, device-specific messaging on mobile. We've seen the current opportunity on mobile, um, and there's certainly an opportunity to get ahead. Secondly, add all available ad extensions, including message, lead form, promotion, price, and app extensions. And as we said, with the growth in the app recently, um, or app usage, I should say, there really is a good opportunity. And then finally, consider universal app campaigns if you're not already. Now is definitely the time to promote your app uh, to potential customers. So a summary of our PPC tip. So firstly, improving quality scores will deliver big savings. We've seen how expensive it can be. The key is to focus on the component metrics at keyword level to make sure that you can boost those scores and, and deliver some of those savings. Secondly, landing page load speeds are huge areas of opportunity. Even the best in the market could still be better. And then thirdly, use audiences to allow big data to work in your favor. And that brings us on to our second poll, as you can hopefully see on the screen. Um, and that poll is asked the question, when did you last audit your PPC activity? Uh, was it less than three months ago, three to six months ago, six to 12 months ago, or more than 12 months ago? And I will now open that poll and share it with our audience. Okay, so we may have to come back to that, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but essentially, um, for, from our perspective, um, when it comes to auditing activity, it's something we do very regularly uh, with both prospects and existing clients, and it's something that should be done on a quarterly basis. Um, so if you haven't reviewed your activity recently, if you haven't audited it, um, then by all means get in touch with us uh, and we can 
look to run an audit for you. As we've mentioned, the points we've covered today are just a few points of some of the key opportunities that we tend to see within accounts. Um, but these audits do cover uh, typically 10 areas, 11 if we're talking about video as well. Um, and they cover 146 points and best practices. So we'll Matt, I'm not so sure people can see your screen. Can you see it, Sam? No. How about now? There you go. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Well, well, well luckily <laughs> for everyone, it was uh, simply a placeholder um, uh, to, to, to show that they can get an audit and, and get in touch if need be. Excellent. Cool. That's all from me. I'm now going to hand back to uh, to Max. Yep. Everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can. Yep. Cool. Okay. Great. So, um, so it, just for me, it's um, th thanks for listening, everyone. Obviously, Matt, that was a really nice presentation. Um, we obviously heard some great insights from Sam as well. We haven't had too many questions come through. We are going to do a Q and A afterwards. So, if you want to pop some questions in the question box now, um, we can answer them in a couple of minutes. Um, what I did want to let you know about is we have uh, some more pajama webinars coming up. Um, as Matt mentioned, we have dedicated webinars to both YouTube and LinkedIn. We have a LinkedIn masterclass on the 22nd of April, and we have our YouTube webinar on the 16th. And then, as I said beforehand, we have part two of, of this webinar. So um, on the 21st of April, we'll be talking about driving acquisitions with creative content and how to utilize YouTube. Um, I'll also send around the links afterwards via email, so feel free to, to register. We've had some great feedback from our webinars. If there is anything you would like to hear about that we haven't covered, just, just let us know and we can obviously provide that in the next one. So just kind of moving on really to, to the Q&A, um, we have had a couple of questions, um, which I can ask now. Um, so the first one was, was for Matt. Matt Lachlan, um, Matt, it was, can we see quality score data for, for each keyword we bid against? Would help if I unmuted, there we go. Yes, we can is the answer to that. Uh, so within our keyword reports, we can see the quality scores for each individual keyword um, and the component metrics for those as well. But you do need to customize the columns within your reports um, to make sure that you see that, which is why it tends to be missed. Um, it is tucked away slightly within the interface. Um, but yes, you can. Fine. OK. And, and there's another one for you, Matt, which was just um, how do you know which in market and affinity audiences are to add? Well, I think there's, there's two approaches. So um, some people tend to look at so the audience insights option, which is available within the audience manager within the Google Ads interface that will show you um, some audiences that you might like to use uh, within your campaigns. But to be honest with you, the approach that we tend to take as a team is we would add all of the audiences that are available to all of our campaigns and set them as observations. Uh, because we have seen some surprises. It's quite often, you know, you do see some correlations between certain audiences that you wouldn't expect um, that do allow for more effective bidding. So our approach at the minute, very much in 2020, is add all audiences, build the observations, see the data, um, and you don't yeah. have to act on that data, but if you build it and it's there, then you have the option to. Okay, that's great. Thank you. As I said, we'll, um, we can reply to your questions kind of via email afterwards. Um, a few people have asked if they can get the slides. As I said, we will be sending them around as well after the webinar, so you will be able to view them. Um, as the webinar has been recorded, it's going to be published on our vlog too, so you should be able to, to view it on there. Um, and then really, it's just kind of to say again, kind of thank you for listening. Uh, we hope we've kind of entertained and educated you for the last hour. As I said, we are going to be following up with, with questions and a recording of the webinar. And we would love to hear from you all. So we will be sending around um, a quick survey. So if you wouldn't mind just filling that in, it'll be great to hear your feedback. Um, but most importantly, thanks for listening. Um, and remember, obviously, stay safe, stay safe, uh, stay home and, and obviously keep washing your hands. Thanks, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.